So uh, thanks a lot, Martin, for inviting me to ICTS. It's uh, always great to be here and to be back in Bangalore, which is where I did my PhD uh, several years ago. <clears throat> and it so happens that my PhD advisor is organizing this conference along with uh, Martin. So uh, to today I'm going to talk to you about, uh, there's going to be a little bit of networks. So there's some carryover from uh, Sarika's talk. But this is going to be very different in terms of the kind of things that we talk about. I'm a, I'm of course going to talk about metabolism, which is my, uh, you know, <laughs> favorite process in the cell. And I'll talk to you about how we can understand the interactions happening between microbes in, in general, and in particular how uh, we can study that in the gut microbiome. So I think, you know, all of us are aware of the importance of the gut uh, today. So the human gut is a very complex ecosystem with many roles in health and disease. The composition, though, is highly variable. So, you know, there's even this classic study which was published on, you know, the microbiome of two identical twins right after delivery and they were like, you know, vastly different. And uh, it depends upon the stage of life, diet, environmental exposure, and importantly, antibiotic usage. And I think in a country like India, where there's a lot of antibiotic abuse and uh, lack of awareness is a major uh, cause for worry. So antibiotic uh, usage is a major cause for gut dysbiosis, and there's basically collateral damage to gut microflora. Uh, I don't know if uh, Professor Suma talked about this uh, a few days back when, you know, when we uh, <clears throat> were looking to design uh, or like predict drug targets for TB, we were trying to eliminate those proteins which had similarity to gut flora proteins as well. Because there's always this cross effect on the gut flora. If you take a classic uh, uh, target like isocitrate lyase, it's a very popular target in mycobacterium tuberculosis, but it has, uh, you know, it's similar to every other gut flora isocitrate uh, lyase. So, so these are challenges. Uh, so whenever you take drugs, uh, you must all be familiar, unfortunately, that you take antibiotics alongside some B supplements and things like that to try to offset for the kind of effect it has on your gut microbiome. And of course, antibiotic uh, in introduce, induces changes in the composition and also the danger of uh, resistance. But the good news is the gut does recover following antibiotic treatment. Well, of course, right? So most of us have taken antibiotics and are still healthy. And But how long does the recovery take? Uh, it uh, varies from individual to individual. I have, uh, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I have seen some, uh, you know, <coughs> really uh, scary reports which say that, you know, the profile doesn't recover even 24 months post-treatment and so on. But I think, you know, somewhere between 6 to 12 months post-treatment, there is nearly complete recovery in most cases. And there are specific groups of organisms that accelerate this recovery. This is quite interesting. So can you start having, uh, you know, probiotics of this sort, like things that uh, uh, induce these and uh, so on? Let me start my own timer. <laughs> right? Uh, so that can induce these kinds of uh, uh, effects and so on. And it turned out that, you know, there's a group of uh, people uh, who identified about 20 different species, um, sort of keystone species, uh, not in the gut, but for recovery or rapid recovery of the gut microbiome profile. Right? And they particularly noted some synergy between bacteroids, theta, iota, omicron, and uh, bifidobacterium adolescentis. And uh, bifidobacterium, of course, is a very favorite organism for most people that work on the gut because it's, uh, it's a very crucial component of the infant gut microbiome. And it sort of rapidly falls off in adults, but it has very interesting roles. It has some very interesting pathways like the bifid shunt and so on, all of which contribute towards its unique uh, characteristics and things like that. So this is really, you know, what I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, I'm going to try and understand or unravel the complexity of microbial interactions in the gut and only through a metabolic perspective. There are like a zillion things happening, but we will focus on metabolism in the gut and how there are metabolic exchanges or interactions between organisms in the gut. So please feel free to stop me at any point of time because, uh, I mean, this might be a research talk and not the workshop talk of next week, but I want it to be as pedagogical as possible. So feel free to stop me and uh, you know, ask me questions if you want to understand anything a little more. 
and I always talk about metabolic networks, and I show this, uh, you know, complicated figure, and, uh, <clears throat> and I basically call this the simplified view of metabolism. It's a little intimidating, but essentially most of you will agree that it's a gross simplification of what goes on within the cell, because you have like one, uh, you know, <laughs> chemical shown here for some nanomolar concentration chemicals or like, you know, some 10 to the 17, 10 to the 15 chemi uh, molecules that are within the cell and there are so many different fates they take and so on. <clears throat> but the good thing is, you know, you can still try to mass, uh, like understand this complexity through modeling and that's what people have been doing for the last uh, several years. And uh, genome scale metabolic networks that basically capture these reactions have been constructed, reconstructed for many organisms. And they basically try to give a good picture of what's going on within a cell. And there are many draft reconstructions for people who are familiar with the term, but these are just like uh, you know, very simplified reconstructions. You can almost uh, you know, pull out of a database. You just feed in the genome sequence, out comes a draft reconstruction. They're not very accurate, but they're good enough for many purposes. And there are many methods to analyze these networks. And what can genome scale metabolic models tell us? This is a very uh, classic paper and a classic picture. So at the center of it, I hope you can read it, is the E. coli reconstruction. Uh, so that's this E. coli reconstruction by Adam Feist in uh, uh, 2008. And it's about, uh, it was about five years old when this paper was written. And they already reported 250 different studies on just the E. coli model. And there are obviously other yeast and other interesting metabolic models. And if you see, a large number of these studies looked at biological network properties. Another, you know, nearly a quarter of studies looked at trying to predict cellular phenotypes. And a huge number of studies, like 27%, looked at metabolic engineering. So these are three favorite applications. And this is my favorite application. So how do you understand interspecies interactions? And like, so let's say you put two yeast together. How do they interact? What kind of metabolites do they exchange? Do they grow better? Do they grow slower? Do they kill each other? Right? Do they outcompete each other? So these are the questions that you want to try and answer based on different kinds of models. So these kinds of metabolic models are very useful. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of model driven uh, biological discovery and so on. And also some studies of evolutionary processes and uh, things like that. And uh, as I was mentioning, this is my favorite uh, aspect of it. So can you study the interactions? Although, you know, I'm not going to talk about constraint-based modeling today for a change because uh, there's too much of a record of me talking about constraint-based modeling at ICTS. So, to so change around a little, as I've already told you, constraint-based modeling is popular for applications in metabolic engineering, and but it demands well-curated models. It relies on stoichiometry. So, if you have like a slightly messy model, you're going to have like very bad conclusions out of the model. <clears throat> right? On the other hand, there are network-based methods. Uh, there are different uh, kinds of these methods. So many of them look at just pathfinding in metabolic networks. Literally, you know, your Google Maps within the cell. And there are others which predict new pathways. This is very interesting. I'll see if I can come back to it at the uh, very end, or maybe you can ask me a question on this. So can you predict new pathways that exist within a given cell? Like what could be the fate of a particular molecule within the cell? You know, this can also tap into potential uh, metabolism that's not yet been studied, right? Because you know some sort of some, you have a good understanding of the chemistries of the enzymes within the cell. So can you predict new reactions, a lot of enzyme promiscuity and things like that. But that's for another time. But we need methods that are scalable and accurate, as well as can figure a lot of the all possible routes that exist. <clears throat> I think with most of these pathfinding uh, uh, algorithms is that they work for short paths in small networks. But whereas, you know, here to, I'm trying to talk about long, longish pathways because I want to see how glucose in E. coli is, the, or like glucose uh, that is fed to bifidobacterium adolescentis is useful for bacteroids uniformis, right? So it is somewhat processed by adolescentis and some byproduct is uh, sort of relayed to uh, uh, uniformis, and that starts utilizing it and grows better or whatever. So we want to find longish pathways across organisms, so you totally need a scalable algorithm to do this. And you know, there are many methods for modeling uh, microbial communities, so this is for the students to think about. This constraint-based, this graph-based methods, there are population and agent-based methods, and very active area of research, lots of methods being developed uh, 
you know, uh, even uh, very recently. <clears throat> so this is a small monograph we wrote last year about it. But there's just so many methods that have since been developed. So it's a very happening uh, area. And the main challenges are, can you make any useful conclusions with uh, draft reconstructions? No, you, it is not, uh, nobody has the time to accurately curate uh, perfect metabolic models, constraint-based models for so many different gut microbes and so on, although there is a database uh, that's been recently developed. And it's also difficult to make models talk to one another. Every group, you know, uses their own acronyms, their own nomenclature, and it's difficult to start putting models from two different groups together to understand what are the interactions and so on. The, the, a lot of studies have shown that metabolic interactions or exchanges in these communities are very interesting, and they drive you know, the interactions, the, how the community forms, or how the organisms uh, uh, stay in sort of a stable community and so on. And it also has applications in understanding many communities or in metabolic engineering, particularly, say, the gut microbiome that we are today interested in. So <clears throat> now I'll just start giving you, I'm building the, you know, ground for an algorithm that we developed in our lab, which is based on graph theory and tries to find pathways in metabolic networks but in large metabolic networks. So how do we go about this? There are some very nice tools that are already available. There's uh, Rahnuma, there's FF, FMM, uh, there's PathPred, Metapath, Atlas, uh, MRE. These are, all of these are nearly very, very good. But the one issue with many of these is that they, <coughs> you know, they're based on different heuristic, uh, they, you know, <coughs> they are not very scalable. So Rahnuma doesn't find you paths of le length larger than six. So many of these are, you know, similar restrictions on the size. And some of them also require atom-atom uh, atom mapping information and so on. So they not only just, you know, do this Google Maps pathfinding, but they predict uh, possible uh, reactions, possible interactions and so on, and try to find the pathway. So, you know, they need a lot more data than, uh, than what is readily available. And the other downside is many of these are, uh, at least few of these have broken links and they are like just too outdated and uh, so on. So there is a challenge in applying uh, these uh, um, pathfinding algorithms to metabolic networks today. So how do we, you know, I said we are going to use graph theory and pathfinding on uh, metabolic networks. So how do you first represent metabolic networks as a graph? Right? So all of you are familiar with the, you know, Facebook and Twitter examples that Sarika was giving. So there's, you know, people who are the nodes and the edges are friendships or follows or whatever. And you know that Facebook is undirected, whereas Twitter is directed and so on. Metabolic network, you can imagine, is directed because, you know, glucose becomes pyruvate through glycolysis. And, you, you know, you have to figure out what is a potential node and a potential edge in this network. So one easy way to cast this is, you put all the metabolites as nodes and reactions as edges. The one downside to that is when you have glucose plus ATP giving G6P plus ADP, how are, how are you going to draw the edges? Do you draw, do you draw it from glucose to G6P, glucose to both G6P and ADP? So these are the kinds of questions that uh, become the stumbling blocks for analysis. And if you see a lot of these approaches use something known as a substrate graph, wherein you take glucose and you connect it to, you take all reactants and you connect it to all products. But then there is an obvious danger. You might think you can convert glucose to ADP and ADP to pyruvate. Right? So the first and last reactions of glycolysis both share ADP, one on the right hand side, one on the left hand side. So you can mistakenly think that this is a, you know, a two-step glycolysis that is possible. And of course, we all know that isn't the case because you need, you know, glucose plus ATP to form G6P plus ADP. And you need phosphoenol pyruvate plus ADP to give you pyruvate in the end. So you can't make pyruvate out of ADP, you actually make it out of phosphoenol pyruvate. So these are some, I mean, this is sort of obvious, but uh, this is a, you know, a danger when you start sim making simplified models using substrate graphs and so on. Well, there are ways to get around this. You just eliminate all currency metabolites. You, the meaning, you know, ATP, ADP, NADP, and so on. That gives you a little better accuracy, but uh, there are reactions where you don't know what is the main transformation and what is the side transformation. So the alternate for that is, let's ignore reaction graphs. It's only of academic interest. There are bipartite graphs wherein you have two sets of nodes, obviously, bipartite. So let's say you have A, B,
This is, you know, so, sort of close to what you would see in a biochemistry textbook. Uh, circles are substrates, squares are products, circles connect only to squares, square connects, uh, squares connect only to circles, it's a bipartite graph. There are no connections between the same type of node. So all the square nodes connect to circular nodes, all the circular nodes connect to some other square nodes. So this is, you know, from this representation, you can actually glean that you need A and B for C and D to be produced. Right? You need all the incoming edges to be sort of active to produce the um, outgoing metabolites, so to speak. Right? So I already told you the issue about currency metabolites. So let's see how we can use this representation. So this is our algorithm. Uh, what do we do? It's a novel dynamic programming based enumeration wherein we assembled reactions into pathways. So we first go through the entire network, find all the reactions, and we now want to assemble these reactions into pathways of a specified size to produce some x from y. And there are two phases. The first step is something known as a breadth-first search, which at least, how many of you are familiar with breadth-first search, graph theory? Okay, a few of you at least, so that's good. But it's like one of the first graph theoretic algorithms, right? and it's, you know, an extension of BFS is, is basically your Google Map shortest path, so to speak. <clears throat> right? And then, you know, the next phase is the assembly of these reactions into pathways. It's implemented on Python. And uh, <clears throat> the key features are it requires only the topology of the reaction network. You know, you don't need a biomass function or any of those things you need in a constraint-based model. Uh, or you don't even need atom-atom mapping. And it is uh, scalable to large metabolic networks, especially those with, say, two or three organisms, which is kind of what we want for today's talk. And it uh, handles cyclic and branched pathways and looks at all alternate routes of conversion and so on. So this is how it looks. Uh, so you have those uh, circles and uh, squares. You need uh, two, reaction, two metabolites for this reaction to happen, which produces two metabolites, which participate in several other reactions. So just to quickly step through all the definitions, so any given metabolic network, a metabolic network can be represented as a directed bipartite graph, G, with three sets, so um, M nodes, R nodes, and E edges. E is the set of edges which, you know, involve uh, links going from M to R or R to M, but not M to M or R to R, of course. Right? The reversible reactions are denoted by two separate identifiers, so we have like a forward and a backward reaction. So this representation disallows invalid conversions, as you could potentially interpret from a substrate graph, and it helps in generating valid paths with biologically meaningful conversions. So you cannot, you know, you, can, you will actually find out that the 10-step glycolysis is the only sensible glycolysis that you can have in the cell. Although there are, you know, some six-step paths and things like that. So the first thing is we have a directed bipartite graph uh, for, uh, for now for looking at um, community metabolic networks. We start with a directed graph of organism one and then that of organism two and then combine it through all the metabolites that are exchanged in the extracellular pool. So you have an organism, it takes up something, it secretes something. There's another organism, it again takes up something and secretes something. So hopefully, you know, there are some metabolites that you know, organism one secretes and organism two picks up. So these form the bridges between the two organisms, as you see here. So here, if you see, you know, B and F are actually taken up by uh, this. So if you see, this is a reaction exchange one, reaction exchange two. So these are exchange reactions that, uh, you know, involve the interchange of metabolites across cellular boundaries. Right? So the non-common exchange reactions are connected only to the extracellular environment. So what are the inputs to the algorithm? Obviously, you need the graph. In fact, you need the community bipartite graph. And a set of seed metabolites. So these are metabolites that are always available. You know, ATP, ADP, NADP, and so on. So these are available. To the cell. This is essentially the medium, medium of growth. Maybe, you know, you also have a few amino acids readily available to the cell. And then a set of target metabolites. So this could be something like an amino acid. Right? So can the cell produce an amino acid by itself or it needs the help of another cell to produce it and so on. And then an integer beta which bounds the size of any pathway. So I want pathways of less than say 20 reactions, 25 reactions. Right? <clears throat> and it turns out that we can go up to pretty large betas like 20, 30 is doable. 
because you know less than that like um, many of the other older methods will stop at 5 6 and so on and that's not useful if you want to you know do some 10 steps of conversion inside one organism then have a couple of exchange reactions to go to the second organism and have a bunch of con uh, conversion steps inside the second organism so you're looking at longish pathways of size say 20 and so on so the seed metabolites includes the source as well as cofactors and coenzymes as i said a medium for growth so some more definitions what is a reachable metabolite i think it's almost guessable that it's a metabolite that can be produced given a set of seed metabolites and a metabolic network. So there's either uh, a reaction R in the reaction network whose output is M and every input of that reaction is already producible. So you cannot have if one input is missing this reaction cannot fire so to speak. And uh, let's ignore this for the moment branched and cyclic pathways that's those are added complexities. So what is the size of the pathway? It is basically the size of the reaction, the complete reaction set that is required to produce. I might require R1, R2, R3, R4. See, this may not, this is not like a linear pathway in a textbook sense, right? It could be a bunch of linear pathways. You need one linear pathway to produce X, one more linear pathway to produce Y, and then X plus Y gives Z your target of interest, right? So then the size of this pathway is going to be the number of reactions to produce X, number of reactions to produce Y, added and plus one for the last reaction. So let's look at the guided BFS. It's, uh, uh, of course, BFS is the classic grass, uh, graph traversal technique, wherein you find out what are all the nodes that are visitable in the graph, right? So you start at a source node and you visit all the, uh, 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 you know, remaining nodes in a breadth first uh, fashion. There's also an opposite of this, uh, like a complement of this, which is called the depth first search. So there you end up going, you know, very deep into the graph. Here you, you know, examine it in a slightly different uh, way. So this implies a queue of vertices and so on. But um, what is the new thing that we do? This is the same as BFS, what we do, except that we guide the BFS based on the availability of metabolites. In a normal BFS, you'll say, you know, pick a node, find all its neighbors, add them to the queue. But here we can't do that. We can, we'll have to look at the reactions and if the reactions can fire, that is, if all the metabolites needed for that reaction to happen are available, only then you can, you know, add the, the next, uh, the, you know, su successive reactions into the queue and so on. So, starting with the set of seed metabolites, we first find all reactions from the set R whose precursor metabolites are already present in the seed. You know, if there's something, that's, let's say glucose is there, ATP is there in your seed, you can produce G6P and ADP. But now because you have G6P and ADP, glucose and ATP, some more reactions are possible. So incrementally the, the space of reactions that are possible will increase. Right. So these reactions are marked visited and added to the visited reaction set. And I'll just skip some of these steps. So this, at the end of this exercise, all reactions that can be triggered based on the availability of precursors will be triggered and will be part of the <coughs> Uh, you know, BFS, uh, the visited reaction set. Use, the most useful thing for us is the complement of this set, which is all those reactions which cannot fire. So these are reactions that we call stuck. So the expansion stops when there are no further reactions that can be visited, and a reaction node is labeled as stuck if it cannot have the necessary precursors in the seed metabolite or, you know, producible in the re, uh, reaction network itself, right? And these reactions are automatically triggered on later on, but at the end of this whole exercise, you have the scope of the uh, metabolic network, the scope meaning what is the scope of metabolites it can produce. It's called a scope, right? All the metabolites that are producible by a given reaction network from a given starting condition. The scope and we also have the set of visited reactions this is, this, this is, of course, you know, similar to the uh, idea of network expansion that was proposed previously and forward propagation. But we make a systematic note of visited and stuck reaction nodes, which helps our algorithm a little later on. Right? So, I mean, this may have been a little, little bit heavy for somebody who's not familiar with graph theory especially. So all you need to remember is that we started with some sort of a metabolic network. It's a network that converts, you know, some molecules into other molecules. Right? And this network, we, we sort of navigate through it in a specific fashion, trying to find out what are all the reactions that can fire and what are all the reactions that cannot fire. So this is important for us because, uh, you know, <coughs> what I'm going to tell you later on is 
how an organism helps another by, hel by making it fire reactions that it originally could not fire. If this is the cooperation that we are measuring through our methodology. So let's have a quick walkthrough. So the input for our algorithm is a directed bipartite graph from the metabolic networks and the seed metabolites. Output is scope of reactions and scope, scope of, uh, I mean the metabolic scope of the, uh, the network and the reaction set that can be visited. So if you see M1 and M2 here, both are present, then R1 uh, is, can be visited and M3 is also produced. If M2 is not present, then you have R1 cannot fire and M3 also is stuck. You cannot produce M3 either. This is kind of simple, but we basically extend this systematically to a large network. So let's look at a simple network. We start with M1 and we want to say, uh, see which of these which of, which of the whole uh, set of metabolites we can produce? The, the seed metabolite set is A1, A2, which is the real seed, and M1, which is the source molecule. Right? A1 could think of it as ATP and A2 as NADP or something, and this has glucose. So you have glucose, ATP, and NADP. You want to see what all metabolites you can produce. So if you start walking through this network, the first reaction can fire. Second reaction can also fire because A2, A1 is part of the seed. These can all fire, and because all these are available, these reactions can all fire. Because M10 has produced, this can now, you know, go back and produce M8. And now that M8 has produced, this can, you know, produce, uh, of course, this is just cycling through. M2 was already available, so it's not a big deal. But then M11 cannot be produced. There's no way to produce M11 in this network. Therefore, R9 cannot fire and M13 can all, uh, cannot uh, be produced either. So if you see, M11 and M13 are not part of the scope. They cannot be produced in the network unless you give, unless there was some other pathway which came from here or whatever. Right? And the visited reaction set includes all these reactions but excludes reaction 9. 9 cannot fire in this network under these conditions. So this is the background. So the next part is pathway generation. I'll, I'll probably skip through it uh, or uh, I'll just quickly go through it. So we basically generate a large table. So this is similar to the uh, table that we generate for uh, say <coughs> uh, local alignment, right? So we generate a large table where you know, all, like you know, you have all the uh, smaller sub alignments that are possible, right? Uh, in the uh, you know, Nierenman, Munch, or uh, Smith Waterman, of course, I should have said global alignment. That's what uses the exact dynamic programming uh, method. <clears throat> so we start here by filling the table entries, first con considering the seed metabolite. Right? So that is like the base case. Like you fill out the, you know, the first column and the first uh, row of your alignment matrix. And so similarly, similarly, you populate the first uh, column of this uh, matrix. You basically say, you know, essentially, you know, note down what are all the reactions that are uh, directly, metabolites that are directly producible from the seed. <clears throat> and then you look at all the reactions, all the metabolites that require exactly one reaction to produce it. Then those reactions, those metabolites that require exactly two reactions to produce and so on. And these can be made by com combining some previous metabolites. Suppose you have a, a pathway of size 3 to produce A and a pathway of size 4 to produce uh, uh, B, then you'll have a pathway of 7 that will produce uh, 8 that will produce A plus B giving C, right? And if they, you have multiple pathways there, all combinations can also be used here. Suppose you have 5 different pathways in one case and 6 in the other, 5 cross 6 pathways can produce this because you have 5 different ways, independent ways of producing A, 6 independent ways of producing B, you can combine them in 30 ways to produce C, for example. So all those things are considered by the algorithm. <coughs> So for every metabolite, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the original entry we put as, you know, this thing called not producible. We'll just put a bar saying it's some null uh, symbol saying it's not producible. But at the end of the algorithm, every entry is a set of pathways or it will be empty, which means it cannot be producible or it is producible by several sets of pathways. So if the entry is not this empty, each pathway in, in the set table MK is of size K and produces the metabolite M starting from the seed metabolite set. Important thing is, it makes sure that all the intermediate metabolites are also present. This is not that, you know, this glucose ADP pyruvate kind of thing. 
you know that all intermediate metabolites are also producible and all those reactions are included. So some results, so we looked at some uh, standard pathway prediction problems. Can you, how do you produce citrulline from arginine and uh, uh, resveratrol from phenanilin and so on. And we find that, you know, our pathways uh, obviously match with whatever is uh, predicted in literature and so on. That's simply because, you know, we are accurately enumerating the pathways. One thing is we are also predicting a lot of additional pathways because we are looking at all possible ways to produce a particular metabolite, not just one pathway. <clears throat> I may ask what's the relevance of these, but the thing is some of these pathways may be active under other conditions. Typically, you know, the most favorable pathway will be taken in the cell, but there are other pathways that could come active under other conditions, maybe, you know, under a mutation or so on and so forth. Right? And we also found pathways that some other algorithms couldn't uh, identify and so on. But this is to me the more important slide. So if you look at larger and larger networks, we start from a network of size, uh, say, you know, add up all of these, maybe 700 nodes, and go all the way up to, like, say, 12,000 nodes, and you find that, you know, obviously, you know, it scales poorly, it's exponential increase, but this is a good size network of relevant, uh, you know, that's very useful, and we find that you can still get uh, a reasonable output within one minute. That's not too bad, right? And for pathways of size, 25. So pathways of size 25 can be reported in one minute. And we also looked at much larger uh, networks. So a consortium of Clostridium cellulolyticum, uh, D-sulfur, Vibrio vulgaris, and so on, uh, which had basically 14,000 nodes and 30,000 edges. That's a very large network. And even in that, we could compute pathways of size 20. I don't remember the uh, time, but it was still you know, uh, feasible. Probably took a few hours, but it was still quite feasible. And uh, in all pathways, we found that acetate, pyruvate, and ethanol were frequently exchanged as uh, some experimental reports had previously shown. <clears throat> so the one challenge we had while doing this uh, study was that there are not enough experimental reports to go by and compare with and so on. So we make a lot of predictions, only a part of them are validated, and it's difficult to validate many of the other predictions. So Hopefully, you know, as more and more experimental data come in, we should be able to validate or invalidate our predictions. So now let's finally get back to the gut microbiome. I have about, I think, uh, 10 minutes. That says 16 because I started it late. But yeah, so let's say, you know, in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to quickly tell you uh, what is it that we did with the gut microbiome. So here we started asking this question, how well does one organism support another? So this was the question we were trying to answer because there's some sort of synergy in the gut so how do these uh, interactions uh, happen? So in terms of relieving blocked reactions, that was one thing that we were looking at, stuck reactions, if you will. And in terms of improving the metabolic capabilities. So how many new metabolites can I produce now? And these two are uh, interlinked in some sense. And also identifying exchanges that may contribute to better interactions. Maybe, you know, uh, these could be uh, potential targets for uh, overexpression later on. And we also defined something known as the metabolic uh, support index. So this tries to quantify what fraction of blocked or stuck, reaction, uh, stuck reactions is relieved by the synergy or relieved by the community, the presence of a second organism. So let's look at these two individual metabolic networks. And you can then you know, connect them up like this through the extracellular uh, exchanges. And so this is what we call A union B, and this is A and this is B. Now, what we define MSI as the number of one minus the, the fraction of stuck reactions. So this is the number of reactions that are plain stuck inside A, A without any support from outside. A with outside support, support from B is this network. So in this network, how many more, how many, uh, what's the number of metabolites that are stuck? Hopefully fewer are the same. If it were the same, then you're going to get an MSI of zero, right? Because there's no benefit from the interaction with the second organism. Otherwise, you get, a, you get some non-zero MSI. So the MSI basically seeks to quantify the extent of this benefit. How much benefit is actually present? So this is something that we just wanted to try out to understand what happens. And it turned out that very interestingly, we looked at five different, uh, four different examples in literature. And this fifth one was R1 experiments. And we found that in all these cases, we were able to identify through MSI that uh, which was the main strain and which was the helper strain. And in all cases, the organism with higher MSI exhibited a higher biomass in the co-culture when they were co-cultivated. 
So it, it does seem that this metabolic help that is rendered or that is captured in MSI seems to be important to predict which, react, which organism will, uh, will uh, have a higher benefit or a higher growth in a co-culture and so on. So coming back to the gut, there were 20 microbial species that uh, the authors in my first slide identified. <clears throat> so we looked at all possible pairwise combinations of these 20 and we, we studied what kind of exchanges can happen and so on. We looked at uh, the pathways originating from the source of one organism, like the medium, like say glucose of organism 1 to an amino acid of organism 2. Similarly, glucose of organism 2, glucose that is taken up by organism 2, so through the organism, exchanged to organism 1 and producing an amino acid in organism 1. So we looked at these crisscross criss -cross pathways and we basically assembled this uh, association network. So here the size of the node basically captures the out degree or how much help, how helpful is an organism. Right? So the larger the size, more altruistic the organism. And the smaller the size, you know, this organism is, you know, not helping any other organism, but it is somewhat more parasitic, <coughs> right? And edge weight tells you what are the number of new amino acids that uh, a particular organism is enabling. So allostipis doesn't help anyone, but it can produce eight different amino acids in either in combination with uh, theta, eta, micron, or uh, bifidobacterium longum, or many other uh, organisms. So. This is still, you know, there's a lots more, lots more to be done here. This is work in progress, but what we are trying to understand is there's so many interactions that are happening and so much of exchanges that are happening, which uh, are trying to point towards some dependencies and synergies between these organisms. And this is again, you know, a study of what are the number of, uh, so the figure shows the number of metabolites exchanged towards amino acid production. So bacteroids gives six new um, or, uh, six new metabolites to allostipis to produce so many different amino acids. And again, you can see a lot of asymmetry here. If you see, allostipis takes a lot of help, gives very little help. Right? This almost looks like a minesweeper figure, but uh, basically this tries to quantify what is the kind of help that uh, one organism receives from the other. And uh, of course, we find that some relationships are two-way and some are very one-sided. And this is very sensitive to the environment. Uh, I didn't put the corresponding figure, but if you look at the co corresponding figure for a high fiber diet, you see that all these drop off. You know, organisms can be far more independent in a high fiber diet, which probably, you know, speaks to, you know, the importance of that diet because you, uh, here you need a lot of work for the organisms to grow together and help and survive, whereas there, you know, they probably can easily uh, grow. But then we don't know how the community structures itself in either case. So that's still to be seen. And we found that they exchange several fermentation products such as acetate, formate, lactate, and several amino acids as well, like phenylalanine, glycine, and so on. But as I said, we need validation against more experiments. So some limitations of this entire study. Uh, first thing is, if you're only looking at a static snapshot, you know, one graph which ca captures all these uh, interactions and so on. So it's a static snapshot of all the action that is happening in the gut. But still, these graph-based approaches are very useful and can complement constraint-based models. We are doing some, we do a lot of constraint-based studies in any case. So we will be uh, looking at some of these interactions from a constraint-based viewpoint as well. <clears throat> and we find that some predictions agree with experiments, but still we put out too many predictions that remain to be tested. So it's both a challenge and it's a useful list for any experimentalist who's uh, out there wanting to uh, test some of these things out. And the MedQuest uh, algorithm itself is sensitive to the quality of the input network. More missing reactions, more incorrect predictions, and so on. But I mean, there's no solution to this, right? It's, it's only going to improve as we get more and more data on these metabolic networks. And it's also, uh, one thing we should probably do soon is to attach some sort of weights and rankings to these pathways. And uh, we still can't identify very long pathways, but I don't think that's too bad because 30 is interesting enough, I guess. And lastly, we only look through the metabolic lens, right? We don't consider, you know, regulation or signaling or any of the other uh, exciting action that's happening within the cell. We only look at metabolism. There's obviously so much more happening within the cell. So to uh, 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 summarize, the, as I told you in the very beginning, the gut microbiome suffers a lot of damage post-antibiotic treatment, but it does recover. 
And th this recovery is facilitated by certain bacteria, which are called the recovery-associated bacteria. And we here try to understand, you know, what's happening between these organisms. There's a lots more questions to be answered. I think, you know, we've ended up posing more questions than answering. For example, why are these organisms special? Do they have, are their interactions, you know, way better than the interactions between other organisms? So these are questions that we can answer with the kind of methodologies we have in here. But um, yeah, so we developed MedQuest, which is uh, based on dynamic programming, and it can exhaustively identify all possible pathways of a particular size uh, with the two-phase approach, uh, overcoming various shortcomings. And it's very scalable, as I showed you. We can use it to study pairwise or you know even groups of three or more organisms. And the main utility of MedQuest as we see it is either in say metabolic engineering to say how you can have a community overproduce a metabolite or in trying to understand what kind of exchanges or crosstalk is happening in some interesting microbiomes. And here we did take the example of gut. And we developed this metabolic support index which tells you what kind of pairwise interactions are happening or quantifies the benefit that one obtains from the other. Yeah. And yeah, I just mentioned many of these things. And so some of the ongoing work is we are trying to understand reaction rescues in the gut microbiome. So what kind of reactions are compensating for one another between organisms, right? There's a lot of good understanding of within organism, what are the isozymes, what are the synthetic lethals and so on, but what happens across organisms? That's something we are looking at. And this approach is generic. It can be used for any microbiome, trying to understand what kind of interactions are happening and so on. But we still need, you know, robust ways to quantitate it and, of course, validate it. Yeah, the, the tools are all available. So you can, uh, and there is, uh, you know, a preprint of this uh, metabolic support index paper as well on the net. Uh, this paper is still not on BioArchive. We should put it up soon. And the MedQuest paper, of course, is on scientific reports uh, for a while. And Aarti was my uh, PhD student who did uh, all of this work and in collaboration with uh, Meghna, uh, who helped us with a lot of the algorithms and data structures that were required to pull this off, right, uh, to make it very scalable. So this is something we are very happy about. So we do it as part of this uh, initiative for uh, biological systems engineering at IIT Madras. So I invite you to, you know, go and look us up a little more. And also the Robert Bosch Center for Data Sciences. And uh, Thank you for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions and I hope, you know, I convinced you that there are, you know, the graph-based methods are very simplistic, but they can still shed a lot of interesting information on what's happening and a lot more to be validated and learned from these networks, but uh, they give you a first view of what's happening or the kind of exchanges that are happening within, in a community. Thank you.